before Miss Margie catches me, I'm going to confess. <laughs> How many of you were here April of 2001? Oh, well, I should have kept my mouth shut. I was trying to decide what to bring today, and that's when the Chick-fil-A issue came about. And uh, let me say, say this, if you supported Chick-fil-A, if you haven't done so, uh, please do so. Uh, they, took a, they took a risk, and as you saw in the news, they, they had a big turnout that day. And uh, we were, Judy and I were going to go down there. I was coming home from work, and we were going to go down there. And he uh, and Scott, our youngest son, lives in Berkshire, sent us a text message that said, Don't come. I can't get in. <laughs> and somebody was telling me that, that they ran out of food, I think it was, in Berkshire here. But that's the, the Chick fil A thing is not what I want to talk to you about. It was the, the comments of the Chick-fil-A, where the mayor of Baltimore and Chicago said that uh, Chick-fil-A's uh, statement didn't, they didn't reflect uh, those two cities' uh, uh, ambitions. Uh, if that's so, then I don't need to go to Baltimore or Chicago. But uh, the worst thing that I thought was, you know, when you, when you get two sides going, uh, they want a, want a battle. Well, there was supposed to be a kiss in, I think. Was it yesterday? Or the day before? Friday? Friday? Supposed to be a kiss in. Where uh, the same sex couples would come to Chick fil A and, and, uh, and kiss. They were supposed to take pictures of it, put it on the internet, and float it around. Let me tell you something about that. A gentleman at Chick-fil-A makes a statement that is biblically based. It wasn't something that he just dreamed up. <laughs> it was biblically based. The other side comes along, and you know what they did? What they were going to do? I don't know whether they did it or not. I don't really care. But they just blatantly, blatantly, did something that God says wrong. Blatantly did. I want to tell you something. When you blatantly see whether it's a statement or whether it's uh, an actual seed, you're going up against God. In April of 2001, I preached a sermon here, Up Against God, and I'm going to do it again today. Thank you, Ms. Margie. You already knew that. And let me tell you what happens to people who go up against God. You're going to lose. Did you see all the news? I forgot what city it was in. But this city, they, some farmer got put in jail for something or, or cited for something. And he thought it was wrong. Well, he just took his big old tractor out there and just crushed four of the five cop cars in that, in that city. <laughs> crushed them. I, was it a 60-ton tractor? Did anybody see it? There's a six-ton or 60-ton tractor. Which one was it? Six or six? I don't know. It was heavy, though, wasn't it? And he just took that tractor and just crushed it. Now, common sense tells you, you go up against a six-ton or a sixty-ton tractor with a little old Taurus or whatever they were driving, who's going to win? That tractor. That tractor will win every time. That, that car is just a small bump in the road for that tractor. And when you go up against God, folks, let me tell you something. God's going to win. 
because you are just a very insignificant buff in the road when it comes to dealing with God. In, that, in 2001, this is how this this was a, a quote from from a, a, a source that I have found. It said the telegram. This is probably a change of email. The telegram was brief, fluffed out, prepare father. It came from a college boy whose careless attention in schoolwork had wrought chaos with his academic career. His mother replied was equal, his mother's reply was equally brief. Father prepared, prepare yourself. <laughs> it, it's strange how people keep trying to prepare God for their failures. And we cite problems that, that they're confronting. We blame other things. We need to understand that we're not up against our problems, but we're up against God. And when you're up against God, if you're flaming things in front of God, just blatantly doing things that are wrong, and you begin to explain those things and try to explain them away, guess what? God's going to win. God's going to come out on top. Your failures are not His problems. He's interested in your successes. And the one success that he's really interested in is whether or not you have enough gumption in your life to understand that Satan is running amok in your life and you need Jesus as a redeemer. When people plot their own course, people in our society today want to plot their own course. It's kind of like, you know, uh, if you, you go out and you spend good money for one of these GPS things and you don't listen to it. You think you know better. And I'm going to suggest to Tom, Tom, and Barman that they put they fix that thing where if you don't listen to them within a couple of times, it just says, well, dummy, if you know better than I do, then you just drive and just shuts off. <laughs> And never can turn it back on again. <coughs> we want to plot our own course. We actually think that we can do better navigation than God can for our life. We want to plan our own destiny. Everybody wants to do their own thing when, when they're in this world, when you're young. I'm getting old. I found out that, that that's, not the, that's not the case. Let me tell you something. You can plan your own destiny from the very beginning. But the only destiny that's going to really matter is whether or not you're going to spend eternity in hell. Or you're going to spend eternity in hell. And if you're planning your destiny to not spend eternity in heaven, man, are you in for a big surprise. You're going to be like one of those cars that got ran over with that 60-ton tractor. We want to establish our own moral values. That's not right. That's not wrong. I'm telling you, folks, there's a lot of things in our society today that are just flat out wrong. And we've let those things creep in. And, and it's a moral issue. It's, it's, not a, it's not a fairness issue. It's not anything but a moral issue. And when, when a country's morals deteriorate, so does the country. And I'm afraid that this country is getting to the point that its morals are shot and we're going to pay the price for it. We think things are bad now with three and four dollar a gallon gas and we think things are bad with taxes the way they are. We think things are bad because schools can't function and other services can't function. We think it's bad now. Just wait. When our morals get so bad that, that uh, God just turns his head and lets us have our way for a little while just to bring us into reality, then we're going to suffer. You haven't suffered yet. There's not a person in this room that's actually suffered. When people want to set up their own priorities, what's your priority today? Some of your priorities right now is whether or not you're going to make it to the Oak or to the uh, to Cracker Barrel or wherever you go after Sunday after after church to eat. 
You're going, you're worse, sitting right there worrying about whether or not the, the place is going to be full or not, or whether you're going to have to wait a long time. Or should I go there today because the wait time may be worse? We set our own priorities. We set our own priorities in, in, in our everyday life. You can see the priorities of people when you when you see God's church is half full. Some of you say, well, that's being pessimistic. I'm pessimistic because people don't care anymore. I'm pessimistic because we think that our priorities trump God's priorities. Let me tell you something. God set the priorities in order, and that's the way they should be. And the first priority in your life is this, knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior. Putting away the sins that has you have that has you tied down and putting those things away and let Jesus be Lord of your life. That's the first priority. It's not family, it's not house, it's not job, but it's your relationship to Jesus Christ that should be your first priority. But we think we know better. We want to walk in our own strength. How strong are you? In your best day, in your best day, you wouldn't last two seconds against Satan. Strength is not determined by how much you can live, like in the Olympics, you know, deadlift. Hey, those folks can deadlift five, six hundred, seven hundred pounds. That's not strength. Strength is not, not being able to. Uh, to we had, we had some strong men yesterday that they uh, got rid of some stuff and you can see their muscles bulging back there. Especially Brother Steve when he's out there trying to get that stuff out. <laughs> but our own strength strength is not measured about what physical activity you can do but it's what measured on your relationship to God. And when people do these things, they're doomed to march wildly into oblivion. Because guess what? Sooner or later, you're going to land smack up against God. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to get to some verses of Scripture in just a moment. Some of the things that bring us smack up against God <coughs> is when you worship the temporary, you land smack up against God. Or the temporary. Nothing destroys spiritual character like the worship of things. How many of you have ever left your cell phone and all went back to that? Is that worship of things? You can't get you can't get away from it. How many of you have you know, at times found that your TV doesn't work? And if you have cable or satellite or, or whatever. That becomes a major priority, doesn't it, is to get that TV working. Ours tore up, tore up one night, and it was just pixelating all over the place. And when it started, you know what the first thing, and I'll have to confess to you, what the first thing was? Where's the number to pick service? And I called them. And they begin to tell me things that I already knew. And what does that do? Makes you mad, doesn't it? Makes you mad. And you get on the tech service, tech support folks. They can't do anything. The only thing they know to do, uh, oh, we have to count 
TV. And the only thing they don't tell you to do is to unplug the motor, unplug the set boxes, plug the motor back up, plug the set boxes up. If you get past that, you're in, you're, you, 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 you can't, they can't help. But it became a priority, it became a, an, an obsession because I couldn't get that TV to work. And it destroyed that night. It destroyed the next day. It actually destroyed about two weeks before they finally figured out that it was a software upgrade that they made to one of the servers that was causing the problem. But is television so important to me that I let it ruin two weeks? It shouldn't be. And you're laughing at me, but I bet I can laugh at you over a lot of things. Listen to something that a warning. Esau is cited as a warning against this. If you look at verses 15 and 16 of Hebrews chapter 12. Now, what I'm reading you may not go along with what, you're, what you see and what's up here. I'm, I'm using different versions of the Bible today. Uh, but what's up here is the New King James. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, and I think this is the New International Version that I'll read from, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. A single meal. His belly got the best of it. Esau forever stands as a man who saw the satisfaction of human appetites as an end in itself. How long, how long can you go on a meal? I can make it about three hours. <laughs> so Esau, Esau was good for three hours. After that, he had nothing. He was willing to sell his birthright. For three hours, God. How much have you sold your birthright for? <clears throat> that birthright was forfeited forever. The first rank in the family was forfeited forever. The double share of, of the inheritance was forfeited forever. The privilege of offering sacrificing and sacrifices and leading in worship was gone forever. It could never be recalled. Esau's sad condition stands as a solemn warning against the worldly spirit. Look at verse 17. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could not bring about, no, he, he could, could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Esau could find no way to undo what he had done. And folks, when we worship the temple, when we worship the things of this world, we can't undo it. We can't recall it. We can't make it go away. When you ignore Christ, you too will land smack up against God. Another aspect of the life that is on a collision course with God, with God's wrath, is our indifferent attitude toward His Son, Jesus, and toward His gospel. Look at Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 22, 23, and 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come in thousands upon thousands of angels. Or you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. People stand at the last stage of the angels of God's divine, or the agenda of God's divine revelation. 
Folks, let me tell you something. When we get up against God, we need to understand this. That the final word has been spoken in Christ. There are no other words that's going to come from heaven that's going to change the way that men and women and boys and girls are saved. No other words. People can worship Muhammad, they can worship Buddha, they can worship anyone they want to. But when they pass up a relationship with Jesus Christ, they're passing up their access to heaven. It's only through Jesus, and I'll say it again, it's only through Jesus that you have access to God. It's not, it's not through anyone else. You can talk to me all that you want. You can ask me to do things for you all that you want. But I, you have no access to God. You have no access to heaven through me. I have no power to do that. Neither does Muhammad, neither does Buddha, neither does anyone else. Only Jesus. The last covenant has been established. There's not going to be any more deals struck with mankind. It's over with. The covenant has been set. God has, has given us this time of, of grace and mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ. And when that grace and mercy is over, when God sees fit to call this, this world to an end, there's not going to be another deal struck. The deal that, that is here right now is it. And that is either accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord or reject Him and face God face to face. Christ's blood speaks to us of God's offer of forgiveness and transformation. If you want to be changed, it's through the blood of Jesus that changes you. It's not through membership in the Baptist church. It's not membership through, through the church of Christ or the Catholic church. It is the blood of Jesus that changes you. And when the blood of Jesus is sprinkled on your life, it does change you. And when people come up and, and they say, Oh, I've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, and they haven't been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, guess what? They haven't been changed. There's no change there. There may be a little desire there to, 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 to have something that they, they want, but that goes back to creating your own access to God. The only access to God is through the blood of Jesus. We need to understand that. And, God's, and Christ's blood gives us forgiveness and transformation. If you discount the eternal, you're going to land smack up against God. Any of you, don't raise your hands. Any of you ever lived a careless life? Oh, let me just say, any of you ever seen it? If you say you have it, you're, you're lying and you just told us you just told a lie, so you're a sin. Our careless life dis discounts the eternal nature of God's kingdom. I'm going to talk, say some words to the Christians right now. I want you to listen. Christians, if you're leading a careless life right now, you need to stop. Because you are going to run smack up against God. Look at David. David led a careless life and he ran smack up against God. And God liked him. God liked him. David wasn't a, a stranger to God. God liked him. Maybe a little bit more than he likes any of us in this room. But let me ask you this question. David was a man that God loved. Did he spare him? Did he spare him from the, the heartache? Did he spare him from, from the consequences of his sin? The answer, folks, is no. 
And if you think you can get God to spare you on your good looks and good nature and, and lovable attitude, you've got another thing coming. If you have Christian, if you have sin in your life, you're going to run up against God one day and He's going to pull the rug right out from under you. we need to understand that God's kingdom is eternal. When some of you attend my funeral service, you're going to understand that my body wasn't eternal. But I hope you understand that my spirit is. And you can cry and do whatever you want to, but that old body is not going to care. And to be honest with you, my spirit's probably not going to care either because I'm going to be enjoying the home and heaven that God has prepared for me. I'm going to be enjoying His kingdom. And folks, when God's people discount the kingdom of God, and when God's people put a, a minor uh, premium on, on being their relationship with God and getting there, you're in trouble. You're going to come smack up against God. Some people say, well, the, the kingdom is invisible. You can't see it. That's true. You have to die to see it. You have to die and go to be, be with the Lord to see it. But let me tell you something. His kingdom is visible here in this world. Do you know what it is? It's called the church. It's called the church. So when you're sitting in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, guess where you are? You're as close to God's kingdom as anyone on this earth can get to. You can't separate loyalty to God from being faithful to His church. God's going to begin sifting this old world one day. He's going to be begin to get rid of the, the chaff and all the, the things that contaminate the, uh, the, the good meat or the good flour. In hey, hey guys, chapter 2, verse 6, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. God shook it a couple of times. He shook it when Adam and Eve disobeyed him in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He also shook it in the day of Noah. But what did he promise Noah in, in that day? He said, I'll not do it again until everything is finished. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27 says, the words once more, if you look up the verse preceding that, you'll see those words, indicate uh, the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken will remain, and what can't be shaken is the spiritual thing. When Jesus Christ was born, the shaking began. Jesus upset those taking pride in their man-made traditions. The world began to shake when Jesus was born. The first tremors of that shaking were felt when he died on the cross. What happened that day? Did, did he get up? It got dark, did he? And you know, I, I, I don't really think that it was dark as we think about dark. I'm thinking that it wasn't, you know, even in, in, in pitch dark outside, you can, once your eyes adjust, you can still see just a little bit. 
But if you've ever been in a cave and they turn the lights out, you'll know what dark is. You can hold your hand right there and you know that hand is there, but you can't see it. And a little bit of light, if it's turned on, will illuminate a great area. But the darkness here is darkness. Complete and utter darkness. When we talk about that day that Jesus died, darkness fell upon the land. And it was dark. Dark, dark. The tremors had started. But the final thing, the final shaking, will involve removing everything that is not spiritual. <laughs> Only the eternal will remain. And folks, let me tell you this this morning. The only way that you can make that eternal yours is through the blood of Jesus. It all boils down to, to this. You can either cling to God and His Son Jesus, or you can cling to a perishing world. Folks, this, this world is going down the future. Have y'all ever taken a little time when you pop the stopper in your sink and you see how it, what happens? What happens? It kind of swirls around, doesn't it? And it eventually gets smaller and smaller until all of it's done. That's what's going down. This old world is going down the drain. The only thing that will be left is the eternal. Are you going to be part of that eternal family? Are you going to be part of God's eternal family? If you choose to follow the perishing world, guess what? You're running smack up against God. And the only thing that you have to look forward to is like those four police cars that were run over by that six or sixty ton tractor. The only thing that you have to look forward to is being crushed. I pray that God will give you the knowledge and the insight to love His Son Jesus and to accept Him as your Savior. Let Him be part of your life. I pray that you won't take the world on by yourself, but rather you'll let God be there with you. But I pray even more that you'll be loyal to God and His church until Jesus comes. Folks, that means standing up when everybody else is sitting down. That means holding up a banner and saying, I'm for Jesus when everybody's so holding up a banner. Let's be fair. We don't, certainly don't need to be up against God. By the way, the Bible also tells us who the winner is. Did you know that all of this has already been played out. Did you know that the winner has been declared? Right now we're just in little skirmishes, acting in kind of, a, uh, I don't know what they call them, but after a war is, is already uh, conceded and, and they've even signed the peace, paper, peace papers, there's little fighters over here that hadn't got the word yet. There's a lot of people in the world that hadn't got the word yet that God and Jesus is one. And they're going to keep fighting for the last minute. I hope you're on God's side. I hope you trust His Son as you say. Because I, for one, don't want to be up against God. Father, thank you.
you for your love and thank you for your mercy. Give us the insight in our lives that, that we'll come to understand that, that, that you are supreme. That you know best. And that Heavenly Father, you will save us from the sins that so, so terribly hold us and chain us and bind us. And Father, that you can, can give us rest, immeasurable rest, if we'll just trust in your Son, Jesus, as our Savior. And Heavenly Father, when we trust him, we, we also tell him that we're going to take our sins and we're going to let him have those sins. We're going to lay them at the feet of his cross and let him cover them with his blood. Father, when we make, make our decision to, to do this, to be, to be a part of your family and to rely on Christ as our Savior, we're going to, to just grasp a hold and let him lead us every day. We're going to follow him in believer's baptism. We're going to, to work every day. We're going to serve every day. And we're going to grow every day. It will we'll be an example of one that be proud of. Father, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of folks that are here. And the folks that need to make decisions, they know that they need to make them. They know that they, they need to accept Jesus. They know that they need to repent of sin. They know that they need to rededicate their life. They just need to, to come forward. They need to let God let you have a part of their life and, and, and use it and build it up. Father, I pray this morning that we respond as we sing this invitation song as you leave us. Heavenly Father, I pray that not a person in this room will be so brave as to say, I can take on God and win. Father, I pray that we'll, we'll know who our Savior is. I pray that we'll rely on Him as, as our giver of mercy and grace. And this morning, stand up for Him. Father, bless us as we sing this invitation song. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If God has spoken to you.